27-year-old Paul Featherman and 20-year-old Nancy Ba rented a small green home along Weke Road, a short walk from Hanalei Bay on the north shore of Kauai. They had been living together for nearly three years with dreams of developing their own farm someday, but those dreams would be shattered in a night of brutal violence. Sometime in the early morning hours of June 2nd, 1979, an unknown number of perpetrators entered their home. Paul was killed almost immediately, and while investigators worked the scene the next morning, they came to realize that Nancy, who had likely witnessed the horrifying crime, had been abducted by the killers. For 34 years, the mystery of what happened to Nancy and who was responsible haunted both families. Then, following devastating floods, Nancy's remains were found not far from where Paul had been killed. One part of the mystery had been solved, but who was behind the crimes themselves continued to go unanswered. While police believe many locals hold those answers, even after all these years, fear still keeps their voices silent. This is Trace Evidence, Episode 148, The Murder of Paul Featherman and Nancy Baugh. Welcome to Trace Evidence. I'm your host, Stephen Pacheco. In today's episode, we examine the horrifying double murder of Paul Featherman and Nancy Baugh. Before getting into the case, just a few notes about the show. Trace Evidence is a weekly true crime podcast focused on unsolved murders and disappearances. You can follow the show on social media on Twitter at TraceEvPod, Instagram at TraceEvidencePod, or by searching Facebook for Trace Evidence. If you're interested in supporting the show and getting some Trace Evidence merch, there's a Patreon at patreon.com slash traceevidence, or you can donate directly via PayPal. Visit trace-evidence.com for all social media links, donation options, and contact information. You can submit case suggestions through the website or email me directly at traceevidencepod at gmail.com. For many people, the Hawaiian Islands are a paradise of natural beauty and wonder. That was also true for Paul Featherman and Nancy Ba, but what began as a wonderful dream ended as a horrible nightmare. This is episode 148, The Murder of Paul Featherman and Nancy Ba. Morning sunlight swept in from the east, illuminating the brilliant blue ocean as it calmly stirred along the coast of Hanalei Bay. Weke Road carves a slight arc not far from the coast, stretching just over a mile from the historic Hanalei Pier in the east to the mouth of the Viole Stream in the west. It was a truly beautiful place to live, and for some, the very definition of paradise itself. While most came to the area to seek the beauty of sandy shores just a short walk away, Dennis Deasy was on a different kind of trip that Saturday morning. Just an hour earlier, the clanging ring of his telephone had awoken him from a deep sleep, one he desperately needed having hosted a party at his home the night before. The call came from the Hanalei Bay Resort, where Dennis worked, asking him to fill in for his friend Paul, who had been a no-call no-show along with his girlfriend Nancy. That was surprising. Paul and Nancy were known as being extremely reliable employees who had never failed to show up before. Dennis had seen both of them the previous night when they'd come for his party. He recalled them leaving early, noting that they had to get up for their shifts in the morning, so why hadn't they made it to work? Dennis agreed to cover the shift, walking out to his car somewhat frustrated. As the engine roared to life, he found himself getting more annoyed that he had to go in that day, and while he should have been steering himself along the Cahio Highway towards Princeville, he instead found himself turning off. After several turns, he proceeded onto Weke Road, several miles to the east. His car came to stop along the southern edge of the road, in front of a small green home Paul and Nancy had been renting for the past six months. As he approached, Dennis noted the couple's car parked in the driveway. He began to wonder if they'd overslept, or maybe 
had enjoyed the party too much and found themselves a little worse for the wear. Then Dennis noticed the front door, hanging open, and for reasons he couldn't quite explain, the world around him grew still. Each step towards the door felt heavier than the one before it, and while the hot sun beat down on his skin, a chill began to climb his spine. As Dennis stared into the gaping opening of the doorway, all he could hear was the rapid beating of his heart set against the soft rumble of the surf washing up along the beach a few hundred yards behind him. Finally, finding his voice, Dennis shouted into the still house, but there was no answer. In that moment, for reasons which have never been fully explained, Dennis decided he wasn't going in there alone. Walking quickly, almost jogging, Dennis knocked on the door of Gary Renstrom, who lived next door. Unsure of what he might find, Dennis asked Gary to accompany him into the house, and Gary agreed. Together, the two men approached the home and stepped inside. At first, it appeared that no one was home. The house was quiet and still, as neat and in order as it always was. However, as the two men began walking towards the bedroom, they found themselves frozen. There, in the bedroom doorway, lie Paul, face down in a puddle of blood. Quickly, the two men fled from the home to call the police. The call came in just after 9 a.m., and as Dennis explained what they had seen, it suddenly occurred to him. If Paul is in the house, where is Nancy? Paul Wayne Sonny Featherman was born on February 26, 1952, to parents Paul and Helen in Rahway, New Jersey. Paul was the Featherman's second-born child, with him having an older half-brother, Ralph, who had been born in 47 during his father's first marriage. Paul was raised in Cape Canaveral, Florida, and attended high school in Cocoa Beach, where his father and mother were the owners of the Beach Bowl Family Amusement Center. Several people over the years have described Paul as friendly, fun-loving, and talkative. Several people specified that Paul was a tell-it-how-it-is kind of guy, with one article in the Honolulu Advertiser saying, quote, If you ask how he is, he'd tell you whether he was feeling good or if he was in a bad mood. End quote. Growing up in Florida, Paul developed a love for the climate and dreamed of living on a tropical island. His interest was twofold, though, both being attracted to the beauty of the environment and to satisfy his interest in horticulture. Paul dreamed of finding the perfect place to both live and develop plants, and eventually his gaze would turn towards Hawaii. While he began making plans to move to the Hawaiian Islands, Paul would meet a young woman who would both capture his attention and his heart. Nancy Ellen Baugh was born on May 16, 1959, to parents Clarence and Betty in Beach Haven, a township in Long Beach Island, New Jersey. Nancy was described by her sister as the baby of the family, which included an older sister, Linda, and three brothers, George, Robin, and Steve. According to friends and family, Nancy was warm, loving, and fun. She had an affinity for animals and loved growing and taking care of plants. While New Jersey was home, Nancy's father preferred to avoid the frigid northern winters, setting them aside for the warmth of Florida, specifically Cocoa Beach. In 1970, when Nancy was just 11 years old, she spent three months with family in Hawaii, according to her brother, Steve. It may have been there that her love for the islands began to match that of her family. In an article written by Steve, he explained how his family frequently visited the islands and that several of them had lived in different areas over the years. All of this would culminate in the fall of 1976 when Nancy, recently out of a relationship, developed an attraction to Paul while spending time in Cocoa Beach. According to Nancy's brother, his sister and Paul fell fast and hard for one another. Paul, at the time, was spending his last few months in Florida as he was set to move to Hawaii in the winter. Not wanting to be apart, Paul asked Nancy if she'd like to come with him, but at the time, she was only 17 years old, 
and her parents weren't sure it was a great idea to allow her to go off with a guy she had just met. As Steve later told the Florida Today newspaper, her parents came to a compromise. If she still wanted to go to Hawaii with Paul when she turned 18 that summer, they wouldn't stand in her way. In May of 77, Nancy turned 18, and there was a special gift waiting for her. According to Steve, Paul sent Nancy a dozen roses and a plane ticket to Kauai, and Nancy was thrilled. As Steve explained, quote, My whole family had been to the island so many times that she was loving to go back there and live. End quote. At the time, Paul was planning to return to college to work towards a degree in horticulture. Over the course of the next few years, the couple worked different jobs to support themselves and they began saving, wanting to purchase land on which they could farm. Nancy was, according to Linda, mature beyond her years by the time she was 18, feeling more like an older experienced woman rather than someone who had just stepped into adulthood. A year later, towards the end of 78, Paul and Nancy left Kauai for the Big Island where they hoped to make their dream come true. However, things didn't pan out, and after spending three months away, they returned to Kauai, finding themselves on the northern shore in Hanalei, where they managed to rent a small greenhouse along Weke Road. Several friends and co-workers, when speaking to the Honolulu advertiser, explained that the couple was pretty happy with where they'd ended up. The rent was low, the beach was a short walk away, and Nancy loved laying out and working on her tan. It wasn't all just beaches and fun, though. Paul had begun looking for work, and in December he picked up a job as a cook at Hanalei Bay Resort, just a few miles from their home in Princeville. In February of 79, Nancy got a job there as a waitress. At the time, she didn't drive, so they managed to work out a schedule where they'd be working during similar times and Paul could drive them to and from work each day. While working at the resort, the couple made a lot of new friends and earned themselves high praise from their bosses. A co-worker, talking to the advertiser, later described them both, saying, quote, They were easy to work with. I mean, they were really nice people. They were nice, friendly, I think very bright, end quote. One of the friends the couple made was Dennis Deasy, who had worked as a cook for the resort. According to everything we know, Deasy got along well with the couple, and they enjoyed hanging out together. On the evening of Friday, June 1, 1979, he was planning to throw a party at his home, not too far from Nancy and Paul's, and he invited them to come by, have a few drinks, meet some new people, and just have a good time. This party would later become the source of great speculation and suspicion for investigators, but attendees reported the party had been a good time and there were no hints of any issues. According to several witnesses, Paul and Nancy left sometime around 10.30 p.m., both being scheduled to work the next morning. What exactly occurred between the time they left the party and 9 a.m. the next day, no one seems to know for sure. Or if they do, they're not talking. Dennis got the call that morning, Saturday, June 2nd, to come in and cover for Paul, who hadn't shown up. Rather than heading straight to work, he decided to go by the couple's home and see what led to neither of them showing up or even calling out sick, behavior that was extremely out of character for the couple. Upon entering the rented house with neighbor Gary Renstrom, they made the grisly discovery of Paul's body lying in the doorway of his bedroom. Within minutes of the 911 call, Reported to have come in at approximately 9.07 a.m., the Kauai Police Department dispatched a patrolman to examine the scene. Based on the description given by Dennis, the patrolman was told to determine whether they were looking at a suicide or a homicide. After entering the home, the patrolman approached Paul and noted that he had been shot. The officer radioed back that the scene needed to be photographed and preserved. In terms of the possibility of suicide, it seemed unlikely, as there was no gun near Paul's body or seemingly anywhere else in the home. Crime scene photographers arrived at the home, followed closely by Detective Bernard Nea, who at the time was assigned to lead the investigation. 
When photographers concluded documenting the scene, Detective Nea was able to approach and turn over Paul so that he was lying face up. At that time, it was determined that Paul had been killed with a shotgun blast to the face and had likely been dead for approximately 8 to 10 hours, placing his time of death between 11.30 Friday night and 1.30 a.m. Saturday morning. Paul's body had been found nude, with a pillow directly beneath him. Investigators theorized at the time that Paul may have been awoken during the night to the sound of an intruder and grabbed a pillow to cover himself so that he could take a look around the house. It's believed that as soon as Paul opened the bedroom door, the shot was fired, never giving him a chance to see the intruder as he was killed instantly. It was later ruled that the weapon used had been a 12-gauge shotgun. In terms of Nancy, police weren't exactly sure what might have happened to her from the looks of the scene. Investigators found no indication that she had been injured inside the home, nor did they find anything to suggest that she had left of her own volition. There didn't appear to be any money or clothing missing. In the bedroom, thrown over a chair, a friend identified the clothing that both Paul and Nancy had been wearing at the party the previous night. When asked about the missing woman, an unnamed detective told the Honolulu Star Bulletin, quote, We don't know if she's a suspect, a victim, or what. All we know is that we can't find her. End quote. Police initially theorized this may have been a robbery gone wrong. But after a thorough examination of the scene, that theory began to fall apart. Investigators found no signs of forced entry and noted there were several hundred dollars in cash in an envelope on top of a dresser. Beyond that, the home, for the most part, was neat and orderly, and there was no indication that anyone had been going through it in search of money or valuables. When asked whether or not the crime could be related to drugs, a detective told reporters it was unlikely as they had found no hard drugs in the home and only a small amount of marijuana. Paul and Nancy's friends also told investigators that while the couple smoked marijuana from time to time, they weren't major drug users, nor did they seem to be interested in being around people who were. Police weren't exactly sure what the motive for the murder may have been, nor what had happened to Nancy, though they would find some disturbing answers when they canvassed the neighborhood looking for anyone who may have seen or heard anything unusual. As it turned out, at least seven neighbors had heard both the sounds of a shotgun blast and the screams of a woman, though not a single one of them had picked up their phone to notify police. I want to warn you now, some of the witness statements I'm going to be reading in a moment are not only disturbing, they are infuriating. A male neighbor, when speaking to the Honolulu advertiser, described a scream and what he did afterward, saying, quote, a blood-curdling yell. At first, a woman could be getting raped, but I thought, oh, nah. Then I thought someone must have been having a horrible nightmare. It sounded as if she was saying don't at the end of the scream, end quote. A female neighbor told reporters she was awakened by a woman screaming. She heard the woman scream two times, then a long, silent pause, followed by a scream that seemed to end with the word no. The woman went on, saying, quote, You would think the first inclination would be to call the police, but I looked out. There was no light, no slamming doors, nothing. End quote. The woman stated that, afterward, she went back to sleep. Another neighbor told reporters that the screams became quieter over time leading him to believe that whoever was screaming was getting further and further away. Yet another witness said that he believed he heard a man's voice after the woman's screams. All told, as many as eight witnesses heard the screams and four heard what they believed to be a gunshot. At least one neighbor told police he was watching a movie on TV at the time he heard the screams, which assisted them in narrowing down the time frame of the crime believing now that it occurred between 12.30 and 1 a.m. Investigators did note that while many had heard the crime, no witnesses reported hearing car doors or any kind of vehicle driving away. Police quickly determined that Nancy had not only been abducted, but had likely witnessed Paul's horrifying murder. 
Whether or not abduction had been the entire motive for the murder remained unclear. One thing was apparent, though. Police hadn't been called until after 9 a.m., meaning that they were at least eight hours behind the trail of the suspect or suspects. Normally, they would put surveillance on boats and planes leaving Kauai following an abduction, but in this case, that could have already happened. A massive search was launched, which would see police going door to door, checking ditches, wetlands, and any areas where they believed a body could be concealed. An unnamed detective, when asked why no one had called police that night, vented his frustration to the Star Bulletin, saying, quote, I have no idea why nobody called the police. The kind of world we're living in today, nobody gives a damn about his neighbor. Nobody wants to get involved. End quote. Before investigators could absolutely confirm Paul's identity, his father received an anonymous call from someone on Kauai who explained that his son was dead. Paul Sr. contacted the Kauai Police Department and was given the devastating news. According to investigators, they had no idea who could have called him. Subsequently, following an autopsy, Paul's remains were sent to Florida where a funeral took place and he was interred at Florida Memorial Gardens beneath a plaque which reads, quote, Beloved son and brother, always in our hearts. End quote. In the case of Nancy's family, police didn't have much to tell them outside of the fact that she was missing and believed abducted by Paul's killer or killers. They hoped to have more information when they were able to investigate further. Over the course of the next several days, police searched near the home and along the North Shore for any clues or witnesses who might be able to help them find where Nancy had been taken and what might have happened to her. Chief of Detectives Lieutenant Albert Carroll took the lead on the investigation, noting that five detectives were now assigned to the case. Over the course of the first four days, police had no new developments, but believed Nancy might still be alive because they had not yet found a body. When asked about whether or not Paul and Nancy's neighbors were being helpful, a detective stated that some were cooperating while others didn't want to be involved, which he referred to as the normal amount of cooperation. On Thursday, June 7th, several new pieces of information were released. Investigators told reporters they were looking for a potential witness who may have seen Nancy being taken by two suspects. According to the report, which had been delivered to police by a third party, a man who was illegally camping on Hanalei Beach that night told friends he saw two men dragging a woman down the beach. While police were unsure of the legitimacy of the claim, they did express that they wanted to speak with the man. Beyond that, Police told the Star Bulletin that neighbors and potential witnesses were hanging back, not wanting to get involved while the department had received many anonymous calls full of quote-unquote useless information. Investigators also stated that they had received information about a former boyfriend of Nancy's and they were looking into the possibility that he might have come to Kauai looking for her. Police managed to track the ex-boyfriend down. He had moved from Florida to Texas. However, at the time of the crime, he was recovering from a motorcycle accident and was in no condition to travel. Investigators were able to rule him out of any involvement in the crime, and the possibility that he could have committed the crime stemmed from threatening letters he had allegedly sent Nancy after their breakup, though several years had passed between the breakup and the murder and abduction. By Friday, June 15th, nearly two weeks had passed, and police were seemingly no closer to finding Nancy or the person who had taken her. Lieutenant Albert Carroll spoke with a reporter from Florida today and expressed that he felt there had to be something in Nancy and Paul's life that might answer questions, saying, quote, Somewhere in the clean living pictures we've been getting is a very dark area. Someone knows something. There are discrepancies in many statements. End quote. Carol expressed frustration with friends of Paul and Nancy who refused to cooperate, saying that they feared being targeted if they spoke out. He then turned his attention towards Dennis Deasy. First, 
Carol felt something must have happened at the party the night before the murders, and he believed people who had been there may have been responsible or perhaps knew who was responsible. Then he focused in on Dennis himself, who he felt had more information than he was sharing, saying, quote, The next day, when Featherman and Ba didn't show up for work, people at the resort called the host of the party and asked if he would fill in. Even though he is known to be a complainer and troublemaker, he said sure. Then he didn't go to work. He went to their home and saw the door open. Instead of going in, he went and got a neighbor. Why was he so fearful? End quote. It was revealed at this time that investigators had spoken with a fisherman who had witnessed two men dragging a woman near the beach. However, when police began asking more specific questions, the witness started denying he'd seen anything and eventually just stopped answering their questions. Though there is a discrepancy in description, the fisherman mentioned here appears to be the same man who had been referred to as an illegal camper the night of the crime. Sadly, within weeks of the murder and abduction, the case began growing cold. In August, two months later, Detective Captain Richard Sheldon told the Star Bulletin, quote, We've just about exhausted all of our leads. The investigation is still open. We're still making daily checks. We've just hit a wall. We've checked the neighbors. We've checked everyone out. We've followed leads with any possible connection at all, and they just turn out to be negative. End quote. By the end of 1979, it seemed, Paul's murder and Nancy's abduction had grown exceedingly cold. Over the course of the next 19 years, a lot of rumors would rise to the surface, and many of them focused not so much on who may have been responsible, but who may have been concealing the identities. Accusations of a cover-up, of ties to organized crime, and even of direct police involvement inflamed the investigation, which eventually came to a standstill. Over all of that time, the Baugh family never gave up and pushed hard for the case to be looked at more closely. At one point, a lot behind a grocery store was excavated following a tip, though nothing was found. Then, in July of 1998, after pressure from the Beach Haven Board of Commissioners in New Jersey, the Kauai police announced they would be reviewing the case to decide whether or not it should be actively investigated again. If the case was reopened, it appears no major developments were made by new investigators as there wouldn't be anything new for another 14 years. In late February and early March of 2012, storms brought heavy rain to the islands of Kauai and Oahu, devastating areas with massive flooding. Hanalei experienced rainfall for more than 24 straight hours, recording 28.5 inches during that single-day span. Both islands had disasters declared by then-Governor Abercrombie after heavy rains caused flooding, mudslides, water spouts, and dangerously high tides. In the aftermath, a passerby discovered partial human remains near the Violi Stream to the west of Weke Road. Initially, the remains were believed to have been ancient and were secured in evidence along with other remains which had been found following the flooding. These remains stayed secured in evidence until Claire Ueno, a counselor working missing persons cases for the Kauai Police Department, was running down old cases and noticed DNA had never been obtained from the living relatives of Nancy Ba. Steve Ba told the Honolulu Star Advertiser that his family was contacted by Kauai officials who informed them that they had found partial human remains which were ultimately determined to belong to a Caucasian female. At the time, several family members submitted DNA for comparison, and when the tests were run, they were able to conclude the remains discovered belonged to Nancy Ba. Police theorized Nancy was likely killed the night she was abducted, which means that for 34 years, her remains were concealed within just a few miles of the small greenhouse on Weke Road. While it wasn't good news, it was news, 
and it was something Steve Baugh felt would grant his family some measure of closure, telling the Garden Island paper, quote, 34 years of not knowing. Sure, we had speculation, people telling us things, but not ever knowing. It will be a huge relief and closure for my mother and our family. 34 years of not knowing is the worst torment imaginable. End quote. So much had changed in those 34 years. Both of Paul's parents and his brother had since passed away. Nancy's brother George and her father Clarence had also passed away within a year of each other nearly a decade earlier. After receiving her remains, the Baugh family had Nancy cremated and they held a celebration of her life as they had for her father and brother, partially spreading her ashes near home in Beach Haven. Some of her ashes were kept at the time and spread later in Cocoa Beach. It was a time to remember her as she lived, her family felt, to celebrate her life, not to mourn her death. When asked about the status of the investigation, Kauai County Prosecutor Justin Kolar expressed that they hoped after all this time, the people in the area who knew more about the crime would be willing to speak with police. It was clear, investigators believe, that there are people in the area who were there at the time and are still there today who know exactly what happened that June night in 1979. When asked about accusations of a cover-up, of corruption, Kolar replied, quote, I can say that Hanalei was a very different place in the 1970s. We are combing through the investigation that was done at the time, following up anything we possibly can in terms of folks who might still be around, end quote. Steve Baugh told the Star Advertiser in September of 2013 that over the years his family had received several anonymous letters and calls naming who people believed were responsible for Paul and Nancy's deaths. Those anonymous contacts lined up with whispers amongst locals, suggesting that the crime had some tie to brothers who have since passed away, but back in 1979 were well known for being violent, dangerous, and well-connected. Several locals who chose not to give their names told reporters that everyone had an idea of who it was, and for the most part, that idea pointed towards the same people. But even after 34 years, people still felt too frightened to speak a name out loud. Others, though, believe the murders may have somehow been connected to the rise of drug smugglers and trafficking on Kauai in the late 70s. With so much time having passed, What was once fact has transformed into rumor and folklore, leaving many to wonder what truth there may be behind the old stories they've been told, if any. Paul Wayne Sonny Featherman was brutally murdered in the early morning hours of Saturday, June 2nd, 1979. He was just 27 years old. Nancy Ellen Baugh had just turned 20. Police now believe that within hours of her abduction, Nancy was taken towards the Violi stream where she too was murdered. This summer will mark 42 years since these vicious and violent crimes occurred, and for more than four decades, the mystery of what transpired that night and who exactly was behind it has haunted two families. In February of 2014, Seven years ago, as of this episode's release, Steve Baugh wrote a powerful guest commentary article in the Honolulu Star Advertiser. In it, he discussed what happened to Paul and his sister, as well as his own belief that someone out there holds the answers. Steve wrote, quote, At one o'clock in the morning on June 2nd, 1979, two weeks after her 20th birthday, a period of life that should be the beginning of the best times of your life. My sister witnessed her boyfriend of three years being shot in the face with a 12-gauge shotgun. The blast tore a large portion of his face off as he fell to the floor and died instantly. She was then wrapped in a blanket and forcibly abducted from her home on Weke Road in Hanalei. While outside her home, 
She was thrashing, kicking, and screaming for help at the top of her lungs. No help ever came. No phone calls to police, no report of a gunshot or screams for help. No police or anyone else came out that night to offer any assistance, and the people, seven reported by police, who saw and heard her pleas for help were the last ones to ever see or hear anything from Nancy Baugh. No one has ever come forward in almost 35 years with any evidence or new information about who was responsible or what happened to my sister. My family and the Featherman family may never get any more answers about these murders, but I know someone has evidence or knowledge of what transpired on that tragic day. They may go to the grave with that, and unfortunately, there will never be complete closure for our families. The murder of Paul Featherman and Nancy Baugh is a horrifyingly disturbing and tragic case. Two young people living on their tropical paradise working towards their dream have their lives stolen in a brutal and violent fashion. Nearly 42 years later and not a single person of interest has ever been mentioned, not a suspect named, not a charge filed. While some have argued that police at the time were involved in a cover-up, Others believe the truth lies obscured beneath a wave of fear. At the time, neighbors didn't want to get involved, even when they knew something terrible had happened. Witnesses, both who heard and saw the perpetrators, stopped talking to police once they realized that cooperation could put their name next on the list of people who would die or disappear. Even four decades later, people hesitate to speak out loud a single name, still afraid of retribution. During the course of writing this episode, I had the opportunity to speak with three people, all who lived on Kauai at the time and remain there today. They were happy to help me with pronunciation, local history, and stories of what it was like there during the 70s. However, as soon as the conversation turned towards the crime itself and the rumors at that time, they didn't want to say much, if anything. Two of them even went so far as to tell me I might not want to cover this case. Not a single one of them would give me a name, even if in fact those who could be named have since passed away. The fear that silenced witnesses in 1979, it seems, continues to stifle the truth today, if indeed those rumors hold any truth in them. Before jumping into theories, I just wanted to take a moment to note two things about the crime that I struggle to reconcile. Firstly, the fact that there was no evidence of forced entry nor any attempt at robbery. It seems like whoever entered the house that night was focused on what they were doing and they had planned it out. There was no wasted time, no attempts to grab anything. It seemed to be a murder and an abduction and nothing else, which is strange. If that is the case, then they had to know who was there and who they were going for. And to me, that makes it highly unlikely that there could be any random aspect to this crime. Secondly, the manner in which Paul was killed and how he was found. According to investigators, they believe that as soon as Paul opened his bedroom door, the killer pulled the trigger and he fell to the floor dead. When he was found, he was nude and had a pillow beneath him. Police theorized that Paul had heard something and went to check on a possible intruder, picking up a pillow to cover himself as he did so. To me, this has never made any sense. If I heard an intruder in my home, I'm not going to confront him naked with just a pillow. It seems more like whatever happened, Paul either felt he didn't have time to get dressed or the situation didn't seem threatening. I've often wondered if perhaps he was lured into a false sense of security. For instance, Someone knocked on the front door and Paul was going to look, only to open his bedroom door and find a shotgun pointing at him because the killers were already in the house. Or maybe something different, perhaps a familiar voice calling from outside, one which Paul didn't feel he had to be afraid of. It just feels to me like something else had to be going on here. Something's off with what we know about the murder, how it took place, and what the house was like. I just can't fully put my finger on it. I mean, 
It's Kauai in 1979. Maybe people didn't hesitate to answer the door in the nude, but the lack of forced entry makes me wonder if perhaps Paul, or less likely Nancy, may have let the killer or killers into the house, and when the gun came out, it was already too late. I just have so many questions. Were the lights on when police arrived, or was the crime committed in darkness? Did Paul and Nancy leave the party at 10.30 because they had to work in the morning, or did something make them want to leave? Could the killers have been in the home for a longer period of time, but not shot Paul until between 12.30 and 1? It's extremely frustrating just not knowing enough about this case, but I suppose that's part of why it's unsolved. You'd imagine in a crime this brutal, this terrifying, there would be a lot of theories to dissect, and yet there are few. We have the rumors that many believe, this so-called group of brothers, who were known for being violent, vicious, and deadly. Others, though, take a more grounded approach, believing the crime was somehow tied to the influx of drugs in the late 70s and the traffickers who sought to protect their trade. Still yet, some believe the truth may lie closer to home, theorizing that Nancy and Paul likely knew the killers who entered their home that warm June night. So let's begin there. Paul had been in Kauai for nearly three years in June of 79. Nancy had come to join him in the summer of 77 and was approaching her two-year anniversary there. Throughout all of that time, there don't appear to be any reports that they encountered people who threatened them or were somehow tied to illegal activities that could put their lives in danger. In truth, we don't know a great deal about Paul and Nancy's social life in Kauai, outside of the fact that they had friends, many of whom they had met through work, and the night before the murders they had attended a party hosted by one of those friends. Police at the time threw a lot of shade at that friend. Lieutenant Albert Carroll didn't hold back when speaking to a reporter from Florida Today, saying he believes something happened at the party which led to the murders and people who were present there knew more than they were saying. He went in hard on the host, Dennis, wondering why he had gone to Nancy and Paul's home that day instead of going to work like he had agreed to. While some believe this suggests Dennis knew more than he was saying, others have argued that he lived nearby and wanted to check in on his friends, possibly to convince Paul to go to work so he didn't have to. I guess the rub comes in when he chooses not to enter the house alone and instead seeks a neighbor to accompany him. On the one hand, you could call that suspicious, but on the other, would you walk into your friend's home if you found the door hanging open and no one was answering when you yelled inside? Probably not the worst idea to get some backup. For years, it's been debated. Some people have blatantly said he must have known what he was likely to find in the house and didn't want to confront it by himself, and that's surely possible. But we also have to consider he could have just been easily frightened or incredibly security conscious and thought he might walk in on a robbery in progress or something else, and he didn't want to be hurt. It's also entirely possible he just had one of those gut feelings, the kind we all get from time to time, and he just knew something was very wrong and he wasn't going to deal with it by himself. The truth is, unless he were to say otherwise, we'll likely never know. There are, of course, other possibilities. Someone Paul or Nancy could have had a run-in with at some point in time who was looking for revenge. Maybe even someone they knew could be dangerous, but they never told anyone about because they figured the problem might just go away. You could be looking at a coworker, former coworker, or even a neighbor. In this situation, you've got a lot of neighbors who heard enough to know something terrible was happening and instead chose to ignore it. Is that a matter of not wanting to get involved or maybe having a pretty good idea of what's going on, but also a suspicion of who may be doing it and that's not someone you want to cross? Hard to say. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot to work with here other than to admit there's surely a possibility that the person or persons who committed these horrible crimes could have been known to Nancy, Paul, or both of them. They'd been around for a while in Hanalei before leaving for a few months and returning. Paul had begun working at the resort in December, Nancy in February. Four and six months is surely enough time for someone to have gotten a reason to want to harm them. Police theorize that maybe 
Nancy herself was the target of this crime, and Paul was killed because he was in the way. This has led to a lot of speculation that maybe someone had an interest in Nancy that she didn't reciprocate, and that attraction led to murder. I hate to say it because it's so vile and hideous to me, but I can't completely dismiss the idea that Nancy may have been taken that night, not just to kill her somewhere else. That could have been done right where Paul was killed but perhaps because the perpetrators wanted to assault her before they killed her. The possibility has been raised in a few articles, and police have kind of said some things that could suggest that potential motive without directly saying it. It's a truly horrifying thought, but not one that we can completely rule out either. Could someone at that party have seen her and decided to kill, or could it have been brewing over a long period of time? With as little as so-called friends have said about the party, it's hard to know. At its base, there doesn't seem to be any evidence of Paul and Nancy having issues with anyone, but how should we know? So little's been said about their lives. Everyone described them as nice, polite, and kind, but as we all know, there's people out there who can find a reason to kill no matter how great a person may be. So at least for this theory... All we can really do is say without further information or evidence, you can't really rule anyone in and you can't really rule too many people out. Moving into the second theory, that there could be some connection to drugs, I don't know that this is completely out of the question. It's not to say that Paul or Nancy were involved in the drug trade, but we're talking about two people who enjoy working with plants living in a tropical location and who had a little bit of pot in their home the night they were killed. I don't think it's entirely out of the question to imagine one of them could have had their own little supply growing somewhere. Over the years, there's been several homicides on Kauai which have been theorized to have been connected to marijuana operations, even if the victims weren't directly involved. Take, for instance, the still unsolved double murder of John and Michelle Klein. The Kleins came to Kauai from California for vacation in the early months of 1981 just two years after Paul and Nancy were killed. On the 25th of March, their bodies were found more than 100 feet off a main hiking trail. They had been shot to death. What was really strange was that there didn't appear to be any reason for the murders. John's wallet was in his pocket, untouched, and Michelle's purse was found in their car, unopened. They were wearing hiking boots, and their car was found at the bottom of the trail where they had left it. It was later determined that they had likely been killed four days earlier on March 21st. Detective Major Roy Higa, when speaking to the Honolulu Star Bulletin, noted one theory revolved around marijuana. According to Higa, it was considered possible that the Kleins may have either stumbled upon a grow operation or perhaps were getting close to one and were killed because of that. Police noted they hadn't found a grow operation nearby, but Higa specified that the forest reserve in which they were found has been the home to notable grow operations in the past. As far as investigators felt, it could have been a grower who grew suspicious of the hikers and felt they were looking for his marijuana, perhaps planning to steal it. There's other theories, of course, but as of 2021, no one knows for sure. Their case remains on the Kauai Police Department's cold case website. You also have the disappearance of Massachusetts couple Jenny Sun Reisberg and Steve Reisberg, who were last seen planning to go hiking in Kauai in 1990. Two weeks later, their rental car was discovered loaded with tents, suitcases, and the couple's backpacks. The area they vanished from was noted as having several marijuana growing operations, and earlier that same year, two hikers had been killed by marijuana growers. Once again, in this case, the answers remain elusive, and neither Jenny nor Steve have ever been found. That doesn't mean that Paul and Nancy's murders have to be connected to marijuana, or any drug for that matter, but it's a possibility we can't rule out. I've seen some people who have theorized that Paul was trying to get a major operation off the ground and when local dealers found out, they decided he had to go. I've never found anything to base that in fact, though. 
It's an interesting theory, but over all these years, you'd think police could have figured out if they were somehow involved in the drug trade in a big enough way for things to get this violent. At the same time, there's some truly messed up people in the world who won't hesitate to kill if they think you're lifting even a single dollar out of their pocket. I haven't seen it mentioned anywhere, but I've often wondered if maybe, knowing their interest and skill in horticulture, if Paul and Nancy could have been approached by someone who wanted to employ them to run a marijuana grow, and after they turned down the offer, it was decided they had to be killed. That's pure speculation on my part, but during the course of researching this episode, I read a lot of articles about how big marijuana was getting in that area in the late 70s. It's a possibility, just perhaps not the strongest one. Drugs may have played a role here, but to what degree and in what way again, We simply don't have enough information to know. So that's going to lead us into the final and most mysterious theory in this case. That Paul and Nancy were targeted and murdered by a so-called group of brothers who were well known through Kauai as being brutal, violent, deadly, and extremely well connected. In preparation for this case, I had to do a lot of digging into the history of gangs and organized crime throughout the Hawaiian Islands. As it turns out, it isn't as easy as you'd imagine. There's general references, some big names here and there, but there's also a lot that lies beneath the surface. At different times, the Italian mafia was involved in operations throughout Hawaii. There was also the presence of the Japanese Yakuza, Chinese triads, Samoan crime groups, and of course, Native Hawaiians. One group, known as the Company, or in other places as the Hawaiian Syndicate, was running major criminal operations from the 60s through the 80s. At different times, different groups would rise to challenge others for power and control, and alliances would shift. One thing which has been well established is that, throughout the years, the reach of different gangs and divisions of organized crime had a long arm, and many high-ranking officials were connected, from police officers to prosecutors to judges. Frankly, it's a very deep rabbit hole to go down, and while I did my best to follow it, there was simply no way of reaching the bottom without spending weeks or even months researching. Everything is made complicated by the fact that for the most part, locals don't like to discuss it, and I can't necessarily say that I blame them. I read plenty of articles about corrupt officials who didn't get busted until 20 or 30 years later, and during that time, they did whatever the hell they wanted. To this day, if you go to articles about the Kauai police, you'll find plenty of comments from people accusing them of corrupt practices going back for decades. Some of those accusations have legitimate roots if you dig deep enough. But I digress, before I drag you down the rabbit hole with me. To say there are violent and dangerous groups on Kauai isn't really surprising. You can find similar groups all over the place. Wherever there's a power vacuum or an opportunity to make money through an underground system, there's going to be a system that rises to the challenge. So, we have to try and narrow things down. And in this instance, all we have to go on is this mention of brothers. Well, in some places it's simply said as brothers, and in others it's specified as a group of brothers. Based on the recanted witness statements in this case, It seems that on the night Paul and Nancy were killed, there were likely two men involved. Over the years, the Baugh family received anonymous letters and calls naming two brothers who had likely been the two seen that night, but no one's ever said their names publicly. Not the Baugh family, not police, no one. Even anonymous commenters on some articles about this case mention brothers, but again, they never give their names. All I could find was that they've since died, and according to one journalist, they died violently and at young ages. Rumor and speculation says the reason no one names the brothers is because the connections they possessed in life remain, that the group or groups they ran with are still around. Perhaps not as prominently, but enough that people know not to throw rocks at the hornet's nest. In one article I read, A local woman specified that everyone knew what had happened and everyone knew who had done it. She went so far as to say that when Nancy's remains were found, even before she was identified, people were talking about the discovery like they already knew, like it proved the rumors true. It's hard to know for sure one way or the other. Could the killers truly be these nameless brothers, or is it a matter of bad reputations making them seem like the most likely candidates? 
That's the problem with situations like this. What begins as rumor slowly morphs into folklore and urban legend, and 20, 30, 40 years down the road, it's hard to tell truth from fiction, reality from speculation, and fact from assumption. I also find it strange, quite frankly, that people are too afraid to say these guys' names but felt comfortable enough to send anonymous letters in which they gave the names. Also, if these guys have the reputation they seem to, there's a pretty good chance investigators would know exactly who these rumors were about. A lot of people have claimed that investigators at the time did know who had likely killed Nancy and Paul, but that those alleged connections gave them protection, directed the cases elsewhere. I think it's pretty clear that anyone who had seen or heard anything that night was afraid to speak up for some reason, but does it all track back to two infamous brothers, or is this all made out to be something more than it really is? I have no idea, but I can say the people I spoke to about this case were definitely afraid of something and refused to give a name or even point me in a direction to look. So all I can really say is, there's a lot of smoke here, but as of yet, no one has found the fire. Nancy Baugh and Paul Featherman were just 20 and 27 years old when their lives were viciously taken from them. After 34 years, Nancy's remains were found and returned to her family, ending one half of this enduring mystery, but the identity of their killers still remains to be discovered. If indeed the names of the killers are known, if the details of what transpired that June night have been relayed through quiet whispers in private conversations for nearly 42 years, no one has come forward to share them on the record. Unfortunately, without new legitimate tips where someone will actually name names, the discovery of new evidence or some major break in this case. The murder of Paul Featherman and Nancy Baugh will remain open, unsolved, and very cold. If you're looking for more information about the murder of Paul Featherman and Nancy Baugh, there are many newspaper articles which cover the story. The most in-depth coverage seems to come from the Garden Island and the Honolulu Advertiser. If you have any information about the murder of Paul Featherman and Nancy Baugh, please contact the Kauai Police Department at 808-241-1711. Or you can contact the FBI Honolulu Field Office at 808-566-4300. Zero, zero. What do you believe happened? Tweet me at TraceEvPod, message me on Instagram at TraceEvidencePod, email me at TraceEvidencePod at gmail.com, or comment in the Facebook group. Trace Evidence would not be possible without support from amazing listeners like you. And now I'd like to take a moment to thank our fantastic Patreon producers. AMS Radio. Anne Bertram, Alicia Lorraine, Brittany Bivens, Christine Greco, Krista Colvin, Denise Dingsdale, Diane Dyson, Eamon Brady, Floutsy, James, Jennifer Winkler, Joni Berkwitz, Kevin Bonham, Marla Wright, Melissa Brekhuizen, Michael Draves, Nick Mohar Schurz, Roberta Jansen, Sarah Levinen, Sarah Mascaratolo, Travis Skepko, Stephanie Joyner, Stephanie Eve, Tom Archer, Tom Radford, and Tracy Woods. Your contributions to Trace Evidence are invaluable, and your support of the show is both appreciated and extremely humbling. If you'd like to support Trace Evidence, get some cool merch, and get to listen to commercial-free episodes, please visit patreon.com slash traceevidence or go to trace-evidence.com and click on the support option. That's going to conclude this week's episode. Thank you all for listening, and I hope you'll join me next week for another unsolved case on the next episode of Trace Evidence.